know what I mean? Hey, hey, nice to meet you. I can get this. This is my video update from Athens, Greece on this Tuesday, November the 14th. Let's talk about some news. And the big story is that Suella Braverman in the UK she is out and David Cameron, the former prime minister of the UK, he is in. So Rishi Sunak, he shocked the world yesterday with some very bold, very bold uh, cabinet moves. He, uh, he sacked the home secretary, Suella Braverman, I always think of Cruella DeVille when I hear her name, Suella Braverman. Cruella Braverman, and uh, he sacked her. And uh, he sacked her because, well, the reason that is uh, that he has given is that she was sacked because she was pissed off at uh, pro-Palestinian marches, protests that took place the other day, and she spoke out against the pro-Palestinian protests, and so Rishi Sunak had her removed. That is, uh, that is what they are saying on the record. But uh, she's gone as Home Secretary, and then Rishi Sunak, he moved cleverly, who, who was the Foreign Minister, the Foreign Secretary. He did a real bang-up job as Foreign Secretary, Mr. Cleverly. And he moved cleverly to Home Secretary, and that left an opening for the Foreign Minister position, and Sunak tapped Mr. Cameron. <laughs> David Cameron. I was about to say James Cameron. <laughs> no, not that guy. David Cameron. And uh, David Cameron is now... Uh, he is now the foreign secretary, the foreign minister. Is this a, is this a demotion? <laughs> because he was, at one point in time, the prime minister, I believe, from 2010 to 2016. And now he is uh, coming back to the British government as the foreign minister. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, and uh, and Cameron, he did a real bang up job as uh, as prime minister, right? So uh, <laughs> yeah, he did a real bang up job. So uh, Cameron is going to add uh, experience, uh, statesmanship. He's going to add experience and uh, statesmanship to to Sunak's uh, very very young and and very progressive, conservative, progressive government that Sunak is running and so Cameron's going to be like like uh, like a rock to Sunak's storm <laughs> oh man yeah Cameron as uh, the foreign the foreign minister the guy that destroyed Libya the guy that wanted to take the UK into a war with Syria but, uh, but the people of Britain, they told Cameron, don't you dare drag us into a war in Syria. And so that plan had to be scrapped. But yeah, the architect of the disaster that was Libya, that's the guy that uh, is going to be the foreign, uh, foreign minister. I'm not even going to get into the whole uh, pig, pig gate thing where, where a, young, uh, a young university student Cameron was uh, was doing some very weird things to uh, to a pig's a pig's head or something like that <laughs> we're not gonna get into that are we but uh, th th those are rumors I don't know those is the whole pig gate thing confirmed or or, or what but uh, yeah that's gonna be the the uh, the foreign minister mr. mr. Cameron And, and all of the, 
the the EU uh, fanboys and fangirls and fan people, all of all of that crowd is pissed off at Sunak because Cameron obviously was the guy that that uh, brought the the Brexit vote, and then he resigned after the referendum. So uh, so Sunak has pissed off uh, all of the EU crowd as well with with this move, but. Um, they're all coming back, aren't they? <laughs> Tony Blair is back. You know, Hillary Clinton, she's uh, she's giving speeches and doing TV, TV interviews almost every day now. So Hillary Clinton is back. Obama, Obama is, is running the, the Biden White House. He's coming out of the shadows as well. You know, it seems like every week that passes, we're hearing more from, uh, from Obama as well. So Obama is back. <laughs> They're all coming back. <laughs> Bring them all back. Trudeau, Trudeau never left. He's uh, he's the only one that survived all these years and remained in power. But you know, Trudeau must be happy because the gang, the gang is getting back together. Hey, the gang, the gang is getting back together. <laughs> That's what Trudeau is saying. Hey, Christia, Christia, great news. Cameron is going to be foreign minister for the UK. The gang is getting back together. <laughs> the Rat Pack. Obama's Rat Pack, uh, Trudeau and Merkel and Cameron and and who else? Hollande. Maybe Macron can can bring Hollande back. Maybe Schultz. Maybe Schultz can uh, can appoint Merkel as like ambassador to to Russia or something like that. <laughs> oh boy. Maybe Liz Truss as uh, as the finance. Uh, finance minister. How about that? Liz Truss, finance minister, and Theresa May as, I don't know, make, uh, make Theresa May press, press secretary. <laughs> so embarrassing, man. It, it is so embarrassing for the collective West, for the UK, isn't it? You're telling me that there is no other person in the entire government of, uh, of the UK, in all of Britain, you're telling me there's no other person that can that can do a decent job as foreign minister. They have to bring in Cameron. Unfreaking believable, <laughs> unbelievable. Oh boy, Blair, Obama, Cameron. Oh, yeah. So since we were talking, since I was talking about bringing back Merkel, this is my segue into into Germany. So, uh, Merkel, Germany, EU finance ministers meeting that is taking place. And we have Annalena 720i. She was uh, speaking at this uh, meeting of EU, uh, did I say finance ministers? Foreign ministers of EU foreign ministers. And uh, Annalena, well, she had a warning for... Russian President Vladimir Putin, Annalena 720i, <laughs> and she told uh, Putin, if you think, even for one minute, for one second, if you think that because of, uh, of the war in, uh, in Israel and in Gaza, the bombing of Gaza, if you think that for one second, one millisecond, that uh, the European Union that Germany is going to stop their support for Project Ukraine. Well, mister, you are mistaken. <laughs> that is what Annalena 720i uh, had to say to Russian President Vladimir Putin. So Annalena, she said that Germany is going to massively, we're talking massively, expand their support for the Alensky regime. And she said that Germany is going to provide a winter protection umbrella. That is what Annalena 720i said. Let me get her quote here. Baerbach urged her fellow ministers not to focus solely on the recent hostilities in the Middle East, emphasizing that there remained a need to face geopolitical challenges in Europe as well. Quote, our support will be massively expanded, especially for the next year, 
she told the meeting, warning Moscow not to expect a reduction in EU aid to Kiev as a result of the dramatic situation worldwide. We will not only continue our support for Ukraine, we will continue to expand and increase it, she asserted. Baerbach provided few details about the planned assistance to Ukraine, revealing only that Berlin is planning to send Kiev another U.S.-made Patriot air defense system and electricity generators as part of the so-called winter protection umbrella scheme. The winter protection umbrella scheme. That is, that is the plan that Germany has for Project Ukraine and doubling, doubling the money to Ukraine, not 4 billion, but 8 billion. They're going to give 8 billion euros to Project Ukraine in 2024. After, <laughs> after it has been revealed that it was the Ukraine military, according to the Washington Post, General's Illusiony that bombed the Nord Stream pipeline and the next day or the very same day Germany announces that they're going to double the uh, military aid to Ukraine. They're going to provide Ukraine with a winter protection umbrella. Not, not bad, huh? Bomb a pipeline, get money. <laughs> oh man, you know that Alensky is sitting in Kiev right now saying, hmm, man. Eight billion euros? They're gonna give us four billion. Now they give us eight billion after we bomb pipeline. Podoliak, Podoliak. I think there's one more, one more pipeline to Germany. Correct? Okay, good. Let's bomb that, and maybe Germany give us twelve billion euros. I can buy many homes with twelve billion euros. <laughs> Incredible, isn't it? Incredible. The Washington Post reports that Zaluzhny was the mastermind of uh, the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage. And Annalena Baerbach is saying that Germany is going to massively expand their, uh, their assistance and their support for Project Ukraine. What an embarrassment for Germany. What an embarrassment this government is for Germany. Burrell at the same meeting. This EU ministers meeting, Borrell was running around bragging that the European Union has given 27 billion euros to Ukraine to date. And this is the most amount of, uh, of military assistance that uh, the EU has ever given anybody in all of history. And Borrell is running around this EU meeting, really proud of the fact that 27 billion euros has uh, gone into the, the unaudited, unaccountable black hole that is Project Ukraine. Burrell said, our support is increasing. I can tell you that it has reached the level of 27 billion of military support, Burrell said, adding, it is the highest figure ever reached. We continue training Ukrainian soldiers. We continue being behind Ukraine. And then Burrell said that... Uh, that the EU, they are, uh, they're going to get a million, a million uh, shells, ammunition to, uh, to the Alensky regime. They're going to find a way to produce a million uh, shells to get to the Alensky regime. In his comments on Monday, Burrell acknowledged that the bloc might not reach the targets by the end of the year, but noted that member states have gone into the production of ammunition and that the lines have started working. It will depend on how quickly the contracts will be implemented and the factories will produce. He added, the goal is to increase capacity. So Borrell is bullish on uh, the 1 million ammunition pledge to Kiev. So that was, uh, that is Jungle Joseph, Joseph of the Garden talking about how the European Union is going to continue to support Project Ukraine so that Project Ukraine can fight the, uh, the jungle on behalf of the garden. And Euronews, which is the, the uh, EU-owned, I was going to say the state-owned, but the EU is not a state, though it is becoming a state. 
the propaganda media outlet of the European Union, Euronews, they ran an article talking not only about how Germany has has and is going to expand its support for Project Ukraine, but they talk about the training of Ukraine soldiers so that they can send those soldiers to the front lines. And we're talking some pretty, some pretty big numbers, according to Euronews. They are reporting that France is on course to train 7,000 Ukrainians this year. Poland is also training soldiers as well. And uh, what else? Uh, the EU's initial mission, Euronews says, was to train 15,000 soldiers, but it has far exceeded that target and now expects to hit 35,000 by the end of the year. The United States, Euronews is reporting, has trained about 18,000 soldiers, mostly in Germany, with an additional 1,000 soldiers in the pipeline. And Britain has trained 30,000 soldiers in the past 17 months. A training program the UK government says is unprecedented since World War II. So the European Union, France, Poland, the UK, the US and Germany, in bases in Germany, they are training tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. The article says these are, these are people who have had zero, absolutely zero military experience, but uh, now they're ready to be sent to the front lines. And in this article, Euronews says, with their return to Ukraine just days away, the grimness of the future that awaits the trainees at the French base was per perceptible in the men's determined, unsmiling looks. Civilians, not long ago, they now carried themselves like soldiers. They addressed each other with nicknames. There was liberal swearing as the men caught their breaths after storming trenches with fake grenades and blank rounds. French instructors left animal remains in the complex of dugouts and ditches to harden the troops. To battle, field, bloodshed, only the officers had previous frontline experience, the chief French training officer said. <laughs> what a grim picture. Basically, these two paragraphs are basically saying that they're going to send these uh, these soldiers to their to their death on the front line. They're going to send them into the into the Russian uh, grinder to meet their certain death. That's basically what this article is saying. What these two paragraphs is saying for Euronews. What a bunch of despicable despicable people in uh, in the European Union. Absolutely despicable. They know what they're doing and uh, they have no problem doing it. So that was the article from uh, from Euronews. Jungle Joseph, very proud at the fact that uh, that the European Union is going to send these tens of thousands of uh, of Ukrainian men and women, I imagine, to to meet to their certain, certain death. Schultz was uh, giving a, uh, an interview the other day on uh, German television and Schultz, he said that he is open to speaking with Putin. That is what, that is what Schultz told his German media outlet. But uh, in order for, for Schultz to to speak with Putin, Putin has to agree to, to meet the terms of the collective West. He has to remove all of, uh, of Russia's forces from, uh, from all of, of what Schultz calls all of Ukraine. I imagine Schultz also means Crimea. And if Putin does this, then then Schultz is ready to pick up the phone and speak with Putin, to do Putin a favor and to speak 
with Putin. Schultz said that uh, Russia's campaign against Ukraine is the return of imperialism in Europe. He said that Berlin intends to support Kiev with arms and other forms of assistance for as long as necessary. However, he left the door open to diplomatic engagement with Russia, explaining that he has held discussions with Putin in the past and is ready to do so in the future. Nevertheless, negotiations with Ukraine require a decisive step from Russia, the chancellor said, urging Moscow to withdraw its troops from the territory Kiev claims as its own. That is, uh, those are, those are the terms that Schultz is putting on the table in order for uh, Schultz to, to speak with Russian President Vladimir Putin. What terms will Putin put on the table in order to, to speak with, uh, in order to pick up the phone when Schultz calls? I think that's probably a better, a better question to, to ponder, isn't it? What are going to be per Putin's terms to Germany as Russia continues to, to win this war against NATO's proxy army, the third proxy army that NATO is throwing at Russia. What are going to be Russia's terms in order for Putin to pick up the phone call from Chancellor Schultz? I think that would have been a better question to ask Olaf Schultz. In, uh, in France, they have a new a new scheme to arm the Alensky regime. And what France is going to be doing from now on is that instead of just giving weapons to Project Ukraine from the, uh, the French military stockpile, what they are going to do is they are going to allow the Alensky regime and the Ukraine military to buy weapons directly from the French um, weapons manufacturers. <laughs> nice scheme, huh? <laughs> nice scheme there from France. Let me read you what, what we have going on in France to the benefit of the MIC companies. All right. France plans to stop sending weapons to Ukraine from its own arsenal and will instead allow Kiev to buy arms directly from the country's manufacturers through a support fund. French Minister of the Armed Forces, Sebastian Lecornu, said on Sunday, we are now negotiating with our Ukrainian colleagues to prompt Ukraine to buy new howitzers using money from a special fund so that the French military will no longer have to transfer guns from their arsenals. The official said in an interview with LCI Broadcaster. It's a good scheme. I like it. I like it. If you have stocks in the military industrial complex companies, you're a weapons manufacturer. It's a good scheme. <laughs> really good scheme. If you're a politician, <laughs> if you're a politician, this is a good scheme. Absolutely. Absolutely create a special fund for, uh, for Project Ukraine, and that fund can just buy direct from the weapons manufacturers. Don't bother us, uh, Lensky, with, with, with weapons requests. Don't, don't bother Macron. Just leave him alone. Here, here. Here's, a, here's a couple of billion. Here's a couple of billion, and just go directly to, to the weapons manufacturers and just buy the weapons. <laughs> Good scheme that France is putting together. I'm positive that a whole bunch of other EU countries are going to use the same, uh, the same direct purchase scheme that France is putting together. In the U.S., we have uh, an article from the Wall Street Journal which claims that the United States is running low on uh, air defense systems. And, uh, and this is because you not only have Project Ukraine, you have the conflict in Ukraine where the U.S. sent a whole bunch of uh, air defense systems to that uh, war, but the U.S. is also doubling all of the air defense systems it currently has in place 
in the Middle East because of the war in uh, Israel and the bombing of Gaza. And so the Wall Street Journal is now saying that the U.S. is indeed running low on air defense systems. And actually in the article, it says that, uh, that things are, are so bad. Well, this is according to the New York Times, that things are so bad for uh, the U.S.'s is inventory of air defense systems that they're now, according to the New York Times, not the Wall Street Journal, now according to the New York Times, the, uh, the Pentagon is working with the Ukraine military to create what they are calling Franken-Sam systems. <laughs> Franken-Sam systems, <laughs> Frankenstein systems, Franken-Sam systems, where it's a program that the Pentagon is, is trying to put together for Kiev, where you get old Soviet-designed radar stations to uh, guide Patriot missiles to their targets. So a combination of, of the old Soviet systems and, and Patriot missiles, Franken-Sams. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Let's see here. An increasingly hostile environment in the Middle East has prompted the U.S. to deploy an additional six batteries of MIM-104 Patriot missile systems, doubling the total number in the region. The Wall Street Journal reported on Sunday the Pentagon is now running low on the equipment. The Wall Street Journal is reporting. Newsweek ran an article yesterday and the title of their article is the title of their article is one second i know i saved this article didn't i yes i did how to solve ukraine's gop problem how to solve Ukraine's GOP problem. And so this article from Newsweek, it talks to a whole bunch of Ukraine lobbyists in DC, and they're trying to, to solve the problem of getting 60 billion to Project Ukraine. And the problem is, uh, is with the GOP. It's with the GOP and not what Newsweek calls the, the Reagan, the Reaganite part of the GOP, the Mitch McConnells and the Lindsey Grahams, they say that these are the, these are the good uh, GOP members of, uh, of the government, of Congress. The problem lies with, with the, uh, the Josh Hawleys and the J.D. Vances and the Rand Pauls and these guys. And, uh, and the real problem, like the real root of this GOP problem in trying to green light money for Project Ukraine falls at the feet of two, two people. Two people are standing in the way and, uh, and disinforming America about Ukraine and they're preventing 60 billion from reaching the Alensky regime. And those two people are the Don, Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson. That's the GOP problem. Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump. And so the article talks about how, uh, how the Ukraine lobbyists in DC, which is a huge lobby, by the way, a very powerful, very wealthy lobby, how they're working to, to move past this GOP problem and get weapons and money to Ukraine. And basically the solution that they're cooking up is to is to divide the uh, the tasks between the United States and the EU. A division of labor is, I think, uh, is I think the exact words that uh, that they use in this article as they were talking to one of these Ukraine lobbyists. And basically, the plan is that the United States, because it's having some difficulties unlocking the sixty billion for Project Ukraine. The United States, what they can do is they can provide the weapons 
to Project Ukraine and the EU, because the EU has essentially been demilitarized, what the EU can do is that the EU can provide the money and that's how they're going to keep Project Ukraine afloat. That's the, that's the plan that they are cooking up. The EU provides the funds, the United States provides the weapons, except for the Patriot air defense systems for which the United States is running low on. And, and we have an ex, an ex NATO commander, the former, former US military commander, Mr. John, is it John? John Stavridis. This guy must, must be Greek with a name like Stavridis. James, James Stavridis. Still Greek. James Stavridis. He was, a re well, he, he was an admiral, a retired U.S. admiral, and he was NATO's former top commander in Europe. So James Stavridis he said yesterday that uh, that it's time for a Korea, Korea freeze to Project Ukraine. A Korea-style miracle is actually the exact words that uh, Stavridis uses in his analysis for Project Ukraine. And what Stavridis is saying is that the fighting needs to stop get a stop in the fighting and uh, allow Ukraine to enter NATO, allow Ukraine to, uh, to get Article 5 protection, but only for the parts of Ukraine that Stavridi said are, uh, are not currently being occupied by Russia. So the Donbass and Crimea would not have uh, Article 5 triggered. So it would be whatever parts of Ukraine are, uh, are remaining to date. And uh, in, in a few years, Stavridis says that Ukraine will, uh, will prosper and will become something like, like South Korea. And that'll be a win for the, <laughs> for the United States. That is... That is what Stavridis says is the best plan going forward, given that what we have right now is, is a stalemate, which what Stavridis really wants to say is that Russia is winning and winning big. So uh, this is what Stavridis said. Ukraine will overtake Russia in a few decades in terms of gross... <laughs> these guys, man, I, I have trouble sometimes reading their quotes because... These guys are so ridiculous. Uh, Ukraine will overtake Russia in a few decades in terms of gross domestic product, overall agrarian output, and certainly in the sense of being a vital democratic society in which people want to live, Stavridis wrote. At this time, Kiev is in no position to demand a complete Russian withdrawal from its territory, Stavridis argued, touting his proposal as a realistic scenario that will set Ukraine up for success over time, he claimed that while stopping hostilities would be a bitter pill for Ukraine to swallow, Russian President Vladimir Putin will hate such an outcome as well. It will mean he has obviously and fully failed in his objective of conquering all of Ukraine, Stavridis said. So we are kind of back to, to an idea that was, that was floated out about six months ago, which is this Korea, Korea freeze for... Uh, for Project Ukraine and the argument back then and the argument that Stavridis is making now is that you freeze the conflict like uh, Korea and uh, Ukraine becomes South Korea and Russia is going to be North Korea. That's kind of the, the uh, comparison that, uh, that they're making, which is, uh, it just shows how out of touch and how delusional these collective West leaders are, even the military guys, are uh, completely uh, out of touch. Completely out of touch and have no understanding for, uh, for what is happening in the region.
They don't understand Russia. They don't understand Ukraine. They don't understand the, the economics of, uh, of Russia. If they actually believe that if they put a freeze to, the, to this conflict, like in Korea, if they actually believe that Ukraine is going to become South Korea and Russia is going to become North Korea there, they're way off the mark. Way, way off the mark. Which explains why they actually thought that their economics shock and awe war that they, that they waged against Russia, they actually thought it was going to work because they have no no understanding of Russia whatsoever. But that's, uh, that's Stavridis is plan. And you know, this is, uh, this is the second ex-NATO commander, ex-NATO official, that has now said Ukraine should enter NATO even though it has this, this conflict going on. You had the former NATO chief, Mr. Mr. Rasmussen, the other day saying that Ukraine should enter NATO. And, uh, and now you have this guy, Stavrivis, an ex-NATO commander, saying that uh, Ukraine should enter NATO. So something is going on here. Something is happening. I believe the, the panic, the panic that has set in because, because Ukraine is eh, NATO, NATO, Proxy NATO Ukraine is losing so much and things are about to crumble and collapse. And this is going to be a huge defeat for NATO and for the collective West. I think the panic is setting in. And so they have Rasmussen, they now have Stavridis and they're trotting out all of these, uh, these retired generals and next NATO officials to write articles and float out the idea that we have to allow Ukraine to enter NATO. We have to get something out of the failed project that is Ukraine. We have to get something out of it. We got, uh, we got Finland. Maybe we'll get Sweden. If we can say that NATO is now going to, to allow Ukraine to enter, well, then we can, we can run around and say that's a victory. You see, we won. We got Ukraine into NATO and then we got Ukraine into the EU. It's a victory. <laughs> that's, that's what they're trying to, to drum up support for. They haven't realized that, that doing stuff like this, getting Ukraine into the, into the EU and getting Ukraine into NATO is, is actually going to accelerate the collapse of the European Union and NATO. They haven't figured that out yet, but... As we say so many times, they have no reverse gear. And they're definitely not the brightest people on this planet. So um, let's, uh, let's do a clown world, huh? Let's do a clown world and we will wrap this video up. Let's see here. Before I get to my clown world, how about Tucker Carlson in Spain? And he was meeting, I believe he met with the, the leader of the Vox party. A lot of stuff going on in Spain right now. A lot of, lot of news coming out of Spain since Sanchez decided to grant amnesty. So uh, you got to keep an eye on what is happening in Spain. And you know that Tucker, he's, uh, he's in Spain because he's going to probably report on the situation that is going on right now in Spain. IMP Caesar, Caesar Taelis, Taelvis. Good spot to, to finish off my, uh, my video with the clown world. So Business Insider, they, uh, they ran an article 
with the title, Ukraine plans to use winter to cut off Russia's military supply chains and freeze them out of the country, officials say. <laughs> Business Insider, they, uh, they draw upon, upon the Ukraine publication, Ukrainsky Pravda, and they are saying that the plan, the strategy for, uh, for the winter, for the Ukraine military, is to freeze the Russians out. That's going to be the plan. Ukraine's aim for the winter months is to cut off Russian military supply chains and freeze them out of the country, Volodymyr Fito, a spokesman for Ukraine's ground forces, says. Ukraine's main task will be to cut off Russian occupation forces, supply chains, and logistics, both on the front and behind the front lines, Fito said, according to the Ukrainian news outlet Ukrainsky Pravda. If we manage to do it, I think the weather, rain, and frost will help us freeze them out of Ukraine, he added. Freeze them out. It's a good plan. It's a really good plan. Because, you know, the one advantage that uh, Ukraine and, and NATO have over Russia as we head into winter is that uh, NATO and Ukraine, they, uh, they are very experienced when it comes to winter warfare and the Russians, the Russians, I don't even think they even know what snow is. I don't even think they've, they've ever seen snow, have they? So, I mean, you have a very experienced Ukraine and NATO heading into winter. They understand the weather conditions and they're very experienced fighting in the cold and fighting in, uh, in winter conditions, under winter conditions. And the Russians, well, the Russians have no clue what awaits them this winter. They have no clue. And so I think it's, I, I really think that, uh, that NATO and Ukraine will be able to freeze out the Russians. I really think it's a very, very good plan. Maybe this is what uh, Macron was talking about when he said that, this, that uh, December will decide the war. Maybe Macron understood that winter, that winter means that the advantage goes to, goes to the collective West in a big way, shifts, shifts to, uh, to Ukraine and the collective West. Yeah, I think Macron, you see Macron, he, you know, Macron, he sees far ahead. That's, that's the mind of, uh, of a political and a military genius. So Macron understands that December, it's going to get cold and the Russians, they have zero experience with cold weather and NATO and Ukraine. Well, you know, they, they understand what fighting in the cold, what living in cold weather is all about. Putin's in big trouble, man. Putin is in, is in really, really big trouble. He has no idea what awaits him this December and this January. No idea. And Business Insider, thank God we have publications like Business Insider and Ukrainsky Pravda to, to really give us the, the real news. Thank God. Thank God for these, for these amazing media outlets. And we'll do a, fi <laughs> we'll do a final clown world. And uh, this is from... Was a tweet from Disclose.tv, just in. First photos reveal the coke found in the White House, and the culprit has still not been found. And I think these photos were obtained, I believe, by the uh, by the Daily Mail. And uh, you can see the photo <laughs> of the of the coke, and we still don't know. We still don't know who brought this Coke into the White House. Who could have, who could have brought this Coke into the White House? We have no idea, <laughs> no idea whatsoever. Who could it have been? Who could it have been? I don't know. I don't know anyone in Biden's inner circle that could have could have brought in this this coke it really is a mystery it really really is a tough one to crack it's a very very difficult case to crack isn't it 
<laughs> All right, everybody. That is the video. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Pick up a long sleeve. Pick up a hoodie. Use the code the Duran 20 Take care.